and uh, I will remind our candidates up to uh, 90 seconds to introduce yourself, tell us what the uh, office is that you are seeking, and to answer the first question, what do you think are the most important solutions at the county level to address sea level rise and flooding? So again, 90 seconds, introduction, seat that you're uh, seeking, and the most important solutions to address sea level rise and flooding at the state legislative level. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead and use the microphone so everybody in the back can hear us. If you, you'd like to. Yeah, let me do it. Uh, I'm Jeff Solomon, a uh, chiropractor in Miami here for 35 years, born and raised in Miami Beach and North Miami Beach. And a uh, candidate for Florida House District 115. That's not the first time. Uh, things are changing, things are looking real favorable. Uh, I'll share with you. I'm not well, judging you, sir, just to be honest. I'm <laughs> judging the crowd here. Appreciate the conversation, so, folks, but we want to make so sure that we get to the I'm at home with the family, and uh, my friend uh, is at my son's graduation party. His name is Alan Leonardi. And then Alan says to me, hey, Jeff, I hope you're not intending to purchase any property in the Keys. And I said, no, Alan. I said, I wish I could afford to, but not really. I'm concerned. He says, don't, because it will be underwater in 40 years, so if you were thinking about leaving it to your kids, uh, that's where it's going to be. And by the way, hang on to what you have here in Pinecrest, because it's a beachfront property. He said, the tide's coming up, no matter what we do, that's what's happening. It's like turning around a big aircraft carrier. By the way, Alan is the, he's Dr. Alan Leonardi. He's the Director of Ocean Exploration and Research at NOAA in Washington, D.C. He's the chief scientist. I trust he knows what he's saying. And he says we need to harden this community, we need to harden this state, and we need, need to build a wall around it, like I hear Holland in some previous conversation, or New Orleans. So that's where I'm going. Jeffrey, thank you very much. Uh, James, please introduce yourself. The seat you are seeking and answering the question, what do you think are the most important solutions at the state level to address the level rise Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is James Linwood Shulman. I'm also running for State House District 115. It runs from Doral down to Palmetto Bay. Uh, for me, I think the most important thing to do at the state level is to implement a carbon tax. Uh, what I'm advocating for is a carbon tax of $40 per metric ton. This averages out to about 55 cents per day for the average driver. And I know we don't want to pay more taxes, uh, but there's three reasons why this is a good idea. First, it encourages us not to pollute. So if you have an electric car and you're powering it off of solar, guess what, you're not paying a tax. Uh, second, it gives us the funds so we can actually invest in the infrastructure improvements we need. So for the solar intrusion of the aquifer, all of a sudden, um, I've seen a, a study where in Japan, they have similar geology that we do, and they figure out how to stop solar intrusion. It's just expensive, we just need money to do it. And Third, it also encourages us to build a new industry in Miami. So the future, uh, the biggest growth in the next 50 years uh, is probably gonna be water engineering. Um, the Dutch already export about 2% of their exports, $10 billion a year is water engineering. We are a natural home for that, and uh, we should support building that economy at home. So I would love to see that. And okay. Thank you very much for those thoughts, appreciate it. Uh, we will move right on down the line. Name, office that you're seeking, and your solutions. That's the here. Okay. Uh, my name is Julian Santos. I'm running for State Senate in District 36, which includes Hialeah, Doral, Miami Lakes, Brownville, and a few other small municipalities. Um, I think there's four broad things at the state level that we need to do. First and foremost, it starts by recognizing that this is a massive problem. This is our biggest problem in the state. Uh, right now, we have leadership that has reportedly banned the term climate change in government, in the state government, and I'm going to be the opposite of that. I'm going to be sounding the alarm boldly uh, second, it starts by addressing this, this issue head on in a very organized fashion. I think we need a dedicated department for climate change resilience. Uh, call it whatever you want, but I'm starting with the Department of Climate Change Resilience. We have municipalities all throughout Florida that have established a chief resilience officer, and that's great for those localities, but we need a unified vision in Florida that will work with some of the municipalities that do not have the expertise uh, to address the issues in their community. Third, um, we need to become 100% renewable. Uh, the Solutions Project uh, over in Stanford, they have a, a few experts that have looked at each state in terms of the renewable portfolio that is, that is good for each state. As you would expect in Florida, we should be heavily into solar, 
And let's try to get there by 2050, 79% solar overall, 100% renewable energy. And finally, our water infrastructure, as we'll touch on later tonight, uh, we need investments of $20 billion, I'm sorry, $40 billion over the next 20 years. So we gotta, we gotta work on that. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Joseph, and I'm a candidate for Florida House District 108. Yeah. <laughs> for those who don't know, that includes Miami Shores, El Portal, Biscayne Park, Little Bay, Liberty City, um, and Design District. Lots of parts of incorporated day. A little bit about me, I grew up in the district that I'm seeking to serve. I'm a proud product of Miami Dade Public Schools. Uh, went to Yale undergrad, studied hard, graduated, worked with President Carter in Atlanta, doing democracy development work in Latin America, the Caribbean, and West Africa, and then decided, you know what, I don't like discrimination. So I went to Georgetown Law, became a civil rights attorney, litigated class actions all around the United States, some of them went up to the Supreme Court, and I unapologetically kicked butt. Um, then I came back home to serve, became the first black attorney ever to work in the city of North Miami Beach, then became the first black woman ever to be first vice chair of the entire Miami-Dade Democratic Party. And the reason that I'm running is because there's a lot of craziness going on in Tallahassee from people who don't want to acknowledge that climate change is an issue until it's an election year and all of a sudden they suddenly have funds for it um, to a whole host of other things. I have been endorsed by the Miami-Dade um, Environmental Caucus and Bull Sugar. So they speak directly to these issues. Sea level rise is real. There are lots of solutions we can take for readiness and resilience. Don't have time to get into all the details of them right now. Salt water intrusion and dealing with that is real, especially here in South Florida. Um, and there are lots of things that we can take literally from all around the world. I regret to inform you that I cannot stay for the forum because I have four other events, two of which are in my district, and I have a surrogate who's been kind enough to stand in for me. So I will let her take over from here, and I thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's continue on with the conversation here regarding sea level rise the state legislature and uh, sources of funding. Under what conditions, uh, Jeff, we'll start with you. Under what conditions do you feel it's appropriate to use state tax dollars to fund sea level rise resilience activities? Under all conditions, of course, the state needing to create barriers and protection for sea level rise and mitigate the damage and stuff. Can you speak up? Okay. Uh, yep, that's much better. Okay. Just hold it a little closer. Did, do I need to start over? Yeah, I'll start you over. Okay. So, um, the, the state needs to be totally involved with the uh, creating a barrier to saltwater rise and also to mitigate the damages that are occurring as a result of such with our uh, water, with our environment. That the state and federal government, while local governments also should be involved, take a lead role in the funding because this is seriously a statewide and a nationwide issue. Tell us about the sources of those funds at the state level. Well, you would I have changed, you know, brought up carbon taxing, and, and I totally support that. It makes a lot of sense. We could also look at the way that we're taxing uh, driving, for example, uh, through the gas taxes that haven't been touched in 40 years or more. Uh, and a couple of pennies here and there could make a big difference in the state of Florida. Uh, James, how about uh, the role of state funding in the sources? So the state funds, the state needs to fund this. Uh, it is an existential crisis for the state of Florida. And right now, we get the majority of our income, uh, our industry is from tourism. As the sea level rises, that all of a sudden doesn't happen. And then also we're gonna have another problem with Wall Street because we're not gonna be able to sell bonds because no one wants to buy them because what property taxes are we gonna have. So uh, for that reason, I think, yeah, the state needs to be intimately involved in funding this, and that's why I'm kind of part of that. Any other sources of funding you'd identify or you target and collect in the state legislature? So I would also want to target reformulating the budget on the, how we do the budget and make sure Miami Day gets more of its share so Miami Day can afford to put these sources, uh, put the, uh, start tackling the problems. Julian, a uh, question here is under what conditions do you feel it's appropriate to use tax dollars to uh, the state level, state tax dollars to fund sea level rise resilience activities? And if so, what types of tax dollars? Yeah, the, the state has a critical role to play uh, in funding adaptation to sea level rise. For those of you that don't know how the state is funded, which is most people, I'd say, uh, we have 
pretty clear division. We have a general fund, which comes from sales taxes and other fees. And we also have some trust funds that are coming from specific sources, and they must be spent on specific issues. Um, at a broad level, we have an $88 billion budget in Florida. Florida is the third largest state in the country. So that size of a budget and the, the amount of revenue we have is not enough, and it's why we continue to be a back of the pack state. We absolutely do need more revenue. I'm proposing an increase from, of the corporate tax from 5% to at least 10%. And we also have to have a conversation, as uncomfortable as it might be, about our lack of an income tax. Uh, the lack of an income tax is really hurting us in terms of education, in terms of healthcare, and we're really gonna have to talk about it specifically for this case because it involves survival. So we need tax reform in the state. So let's talk a little bit about that income tax. You're yes. willing to touch that and put that on the table in, in terms of advocating for Absolutely. an income tax. In 100%. Florida. And at what level would you begin that? And let me be clear, I'm not ready to file a bill to propose an income tax because obviously that's just not going to be feasible. I think we need to hold town halls throughout the state, clearly lay out the issues in a transparent manner like Daniela Lee was talking about, so that the public understands what these funds are going to uh, go toward and why it's worth it. As this gentleman over here, I think his name is Jonathan Burke mentioned, we're going to pay for this eventually, right? The question is when do we pay for it? Do we pay for it 20 years from now? It's going to be a lot more expensive. Or do we pay for it now? I think the, the, the answer that I'm proposing is that we should pay for it now when it's cheaper. So in Miami-Dade County, according to the flood IQ data, uh, and we saw this in the video, about 8,300 properties in Miami-Dade County are currently at risk of repeated tidal flooding. By 2032, that's going to more than double to over 17,000 that are gonna be uh, <laughs> subject to repeated tidal flooding issues. What can we do now in, in the years of your term, should you be elected to the state legislature to protect those areas? The number of properties in Miami-Dade County that are subject to repeated flooding events now is about 8,300. By 2032, that's going to be more than double. That does not take into account hurricane, storm storms. That is just repeated or tidal flooding. Over 17,000 properties. What can be done now or during your term if elected to the state legislature to address that? Well, I would support municipalities such as Miami Beach that for on hard can, can you hear me now? There you go. Okay. Uh, I would work uh, towards uh, efforts uh, like uh, Mayor of the Beach and folks over on Miami Beach to, towards hardening and making sure that they can remove the flood waters as efficiently as possible. We also got to keep in mind that a lot of these properties are coming from the west side of Dade County. It's not just on the east that we need to be worried. And so we need to do appropriate mitigations there as well. And like I said, the Holland or the New Orleans approach to mitigation is what needs to start right now. And I think that's time later. Was there a second for that? Oh, that was it. But when you talk about mitigation in western Dade County, what types, I'll just have you hold on a minute, what types of mitigation would you be exploring? Well, well, we have damaging for dikes right now, um, but the dikes alone will be suitable because uh, of the deterioration that's going to occur. They're going to have to really hard them, find some engineering approaches that are best practices, gold standards elsewhere, because this isn't just a South Florida issue. And, and there are other places around the world that we know are, are doing this job well, and we are by all means. The, the, the issue of Holland has come up a couple of times, so the audience understands the geology of Dade County is not the same geology of the Netherlands. The Netherlands can build the wall, pull the water back. Dade County, the water is still going to come up for 180 because of the blue light lines. Uh, we have a candidate just joining us, sir, and I'll have you introduce yourself and answer the first question in a moment. But since this, this, just hold on to the microphone there, Jane, since this big question is on the table, uh, talk to us about how you would go about uh, uh, addressing the tidal flood threat that's going to double the number number of properties facing that over the course of the next 20 years. If elected to the state legislature, how would you address that? So if I'm fortunate enough to get elected, uh, I would want to look at the data. So you look at like the National Flood Insurance Program, and you see the properties that keep having to get paid out because they keep flooded and they keep having to be rebuilt. We need to buy those properties and turn them into parks. Uh, we need to have a, a source for the water place where it to go. It's already going there, and we need to make it so it's actually easy and uh, it's a clean solution. It also creates more park space. Uh, put trees, put grass, clean the air, um, we can have that. Great, great. 
Uh, same question, how do you go about addressing that threat to those properties uh, during your term in London? Sure, so as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, you know, our water infrastructure needs massive funding in order to improve, uh, in order to adapt to sea level rise. Uh, so that's really been the, the main source of legislative action for Dade County uh, in terms of how we can help out to address this issue. As I mentioned, it was 40 billion over the next 20 years that is necessary. Our budget per year is only 88 billion. This was our last session, 88 billion. Uh, however, overall, as I mentioned, you know, having a chief resilience officer at the helm with a broad vision for the whole state will have a will give you know municipalities such as Miami Dade and other ones uh, in the county an opportunity to consult with them and you know talk about the specific solutions for each community. Because even though there's a lot of communities on the coast with common issues. Uh, each one has unique characteristics that require a tailored approach. So I would have that department work with them for technical assistance and in getting the financing sources from so many different options, from the federal government, uh, from foundations, from nonprofits, things like that. So it's that two-prong approach. All right. uh, we had a candidate join us uh, after we already get underway, so let me provide you with the opportunity to introduce yourself and seek you are seeking and to answer this question. What do you think are the most important solutions at the state level to address sea level rise and flooding? Well, good evening. My name is State Representative Roy Harbin. I am the current representative in District 108. And in, in this legislative, this past session, I brought on a dollar to the North Miami El Hotel, which is the Arch Creek uh, flood issue that we have over there, and also the, the issue in El Hotel. Most importantly, I found out a little stuff that I didn't know before I got to Tallahassee. And one of the things is that we have a federal decree that would replace the infrastructure of Miami-Dade County. And my job from the state level is to make sure that Miami-Dade County begin to work on sea level rise through the replacement of the, um, um, of the pump station as well as the infrastructure. This is the sewer system decree that you're referring to, is that right? It's, it's, it's water and sewer. And it, 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 to deal with the, um, if, if, you, if you look at the, uh, Drainage system. Right now, the county is storing fresh water under the city, and that means your pump's not working as well enough to keep up with the tides. So we're going to fix that part. Let me ask you a question that we've addressed with the other three uh, folks here, uh, State Representative. What are the sources of revenue that you would identify if, if elected to go back to Tallahassee that you would like to use to reinforce and adapt to sea level rise and the risk of, of threat, the threat of flooding? Well, the flood is not just the one. We will be doing appropriation again to get more money to go toward the, the pump system and the, the, the other bank. Then some, uh, we have a group that came out and said that they want to do some high, high number of houses and businesses <coughs> that's in that zone. You go down to Griffin and 135th Street, you have the royal house there. Every time it sprinkles, the house goes on the wall. You know, go in one of the house, you got a mold, you have to open the whole house. And my job is to, to actually you stay money for the, the road bridge as well as county, local, community development, block grant dollars to the side of us. Would uh, any of you support uh, the state requiring builders to take into account sea level rise in their building? require that? Would you support it? Uh, a simple yes, absolutely. It will be necessary to protect the future. And uh, that which uh, is placed in front of for sure. Yes. Yes, and a step further. Any infrastructure money that's coming from the Florida legislature, I will push to include covenants that require projects that those, that those funds go to fund, uh, those projects have to take account uh, of the latest sea level rise projection. Otherwise, you're not going to change. Representative, you answered the question already. Yeah, no. But let, let me ask you this, because it brings up the issue of, of home rule and, and state regulations. Uh, and we've seen this already being fought in courts regarding some local bans on plastic bags, local bans at bars on styrofoam, on polystyrene. So what is your opinion on home rule versus state control, uh, especially as it regards to environmental policy uh, as it relates to sea level rise? 
I'm not the Democrat. So, your thoughts on home rule versus state policy as it relates to taking the measures that are necessary to mitigate and adapt to sea level rise. So we just all heard I, four of you endorse state rule, essentially there, that the state would require. I would know. I would you know, mean that local makes the decision versus the state. So this, in this case, this, the, the local government would. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. Right. Yeah, I think the issue that you're, you're talking about here is this issue of preemption. Uh, which is obviously very controversial. I think preemption isn't necessarily bad in and of itself. It's all about how preemption is employed and to what degree uh, the situation is that you're overriding in terms of home rule. Um, but I think this is one case in terms of the building codes and requiring the builders to take into account sea level rise. This is one situation where I would absolutely require and preempt municipalities to take that into account because it's for the good of gradients all throughout the state. So I would basically flip everything. Right now, the state controls a lot of uh, home rule. And I would let, give that back to the county. The one thing that I would take away from the county is uh, the, um, zoning rules and zoning regulations and building codes. Uh, that means you're not at the state level. Um, we see it all too often that there are the not in my backyard people that want to stop a development that's going to be environmentally friendly or actually correct in the building right infrastructure. And they have a lot of power to do that because of how it's structured, how I want to switch that, um, bring that to the state where it's more anonymous, and then give the county the actual ability to govern on all the local issues because they have their feet are on the ground, they know exactly what's going on. So James, just so we're clear on this, you, you would essentially do away with local zoning boards? I would switch the Japanese on an interesting model where instead of having what you what you have to do, they have what you can't do. And so there's 13 simple rules, um, and if anyone wants to find me after I can give the link. Building all of it. But it's a really simple process and tells you what is intolerable and what you can't do, and then everything else is fair. Jeffrey, your thoughts? Home rule versus state? I'm a fan of home rule for every reasonable uh, and possible, but sometimes there are constitutional issues, both state constitution and federal constitution. Those things have to be considered. I think the folks in any given neighborhood should decide for themselves uh, things related to the said that this is a statewide issue and I think it's imperative that we have very intense collaboration and dialogue from the local level along with the state and, and wherever possible also try to develop uh, what they call PPP or uh, a public-private partnership so that we get everybody involved. After uh, Hurricane Irma and the power outages, a lot of folks uh, perhaps became familiarized with the Public Service Commission and the role the Public Service Commission plays in electricity and, and other types of utilities. Uh, Representative, tell us about what policies you would like to advocate for to avoid the kind of power outages that uh, the South Florida experience and Florida experience after Hurricane Irma. Well, after Hurricane and Irma. Irma. Um, with power that out. You know, the, 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 the most thing that I've seen was that along the, the water, you have these, these massive trees that's covering the water, and the local do not allow them to cut the tree back so far, and then you get in trouble. I would like to, you know, see how we could readdress the height that you can cut the tree back. When is it endangering the electrical um, wiring within our, our grid? So that would be the most biggest thing because everybody can't afford or could put the electrical on the ground. So we have to deal with what's on top of the ground. And what's on top of the ground, that, that, that being there for this now, they strengthen the pole and they also, you know, we need to Julian, how about uh, for you? What would you like to address? Sure. So I, I, I would not even pretend to be you know, remotely knowledgeable about what specific steps we would need to take uh, at a granular level in order to avoid you know the length of power outages we have. But I think you know we do have to start looking seriously 
at you know, moving our power wires underground. Uh, I think experts you know, everywhere have been talking about how beneficial this is, and yes, it is expensive. And is it going to work? Is it going to be feasible in all situations? Probably not. Uh, but in the situations where it is feasible, I think our state and our, our local municipalities should absolutely look, be looking into it. And that starts at the top with our, our utility companies, with, especially with the Public Services Commission, with FPL, Duke Energy, all the other utility companies we have here in Florida. If you want to operate in Florida, it's a privilege, and that privilege can be revoked. You have to serve this community properly and address the issues that we're facing. Otherwise, you're not going to do business in Florida. By addressing business, what, what are you referring to there? What do you mean? Yeah, I mean, these utility companies, they're businesses, they are monopolies that we are authorizing uh, per contract with the state of Florida to uh, run our electric grid. <coughs> However, that, that contract can be renegotiated. And unless, you know, we feel that these companies are adequately addressing the issues that we're facing, such as you know, implementing these you know, more robust power structures, then, then we should renegotiate. I mean, they're not meeting our needs. James, uh, how would you rethink it? So, uh, quick story. My in-laws, after Wilma, I think it was seven or eight weeks before they got the power back. And what happened is they were talking to the Duke Energy, which people came back in the dead at the end. And they were shocked at why, like, the infrastructure. Yeah, they said this is 1960s technology, and this was in 2005. And the problem is, at p &L, they don't invest in the infrastructure the way that they should be investing. So if they care about operating in this community, they should be investing in this community. And I would uh, want to renegotiate any deals that we have with their monopoly and make sure that they're actually investing. So since we'll know what FPL will tell you is they've invested over a billion dollars in parking the system, and one of the reasons that this, the, the FPL credits for putting the power back on after Irma was that they hardened the transmission lines that went down and were subjects to the, uh, the storm in the middle of 2005. And if they told me that, what I would tell them is, if I were your shareholder, I'd be screaming at how you're wasting money on other infrastructure. If you spend a billion dollars and took that long, uh, you need better leadership. Good. Jeffrey, how about the relationship with FPL, specifically in the state? FPL has, as the purveyor of electric community here and there are other players in different parts of the state not been responsible in mitigation having been through those hurricanes and having had to deal with certain damages and power outages most recently uh, for uh, 10 12 days. Um, the bottom line is that they understand the kind of geology and kind of uh, the environment, the retreat that we deal with and, and there are ways to collaboratively with the municipalities or the county uh, be able to go in and turn trees appropriately. Now, where, where possible and feasible, underground cables should be used, but that's not always the best way. You really have to look at the engineering where sometimes keeping things above ground is better. So you have to really think that through it and let the professionals decide. But there needs to be a better relationship, a more responsible relationship to the people it serves, as the others have said, they want to keep their license in practice. <coughs> so let me also uh, ask you about the environment in Tallahassee, which is uh, a state legislature that is uh, majority controlled by the Republican Party. Uh, so that's the reality that any of you would face should you be reelected or elected to Tallahassee. So Representative how do you go first, since you're most familiar with this, how do you address the partisanship that has taken place in Tallahassee and the majority, if not the super majority, that Republicans have in the state legislature with regards to issues on sea level rise and addressing flooding that we've articulated here today. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> being a Democrat in you know, Republican control power, if you look at my brochure, as a freshman, I did pretty well. I got in trouble by not only the Democratic Party, but some of my black folks in my own community about bringing home well-needed dollars to fix well-needed problems because I crossed the power line and made progress with bringing home money to do sea level rising in the North Island and the airport area to give our seniors. Needed food to help fund team 
pregnancy, you know, all the different things. So for me, it became a problem. I, I got with a cross body line, but I sell them so, but actually bring some home to the district. Well, you're right. That's that's a reality that any Democrat with an agenda in Tallahassee is going to have to confront. Uh, having said that, I think here on this issue of climate change and sea level rise, uh, we really have to do a better job of not making it such a partisan issue. I, I think uh, in and of itself, it should, you know, this is something that everybody should get behind. Uh, what I intend to do is, yes, I'm going to call out the folks in Tallahassee that are not doing their job on this, boldly. However, I also want to work with folks across the aisle uh, and you know, meet in common ground wherever we can. This, this cannot be a Democrat-Republican issue. This has to be a Floridian and American issue. And that's the type of uh, state center that I tend to be. One of the things that I would like to see in Tallahassee is uh, getting the Broward delegation, Palm Beach delegation, the Miami Day delegation to band together a little more on issues like climate change. Um, so we are all the front line. We are all in the existential crisis zone where this, we don't do anything we don't have a community in 70 years. So we also add it to about 34% of the elected officials in Tallahassee. Um, so it's not a majority, but it is a large voting block. And if we could work together and unite, we could actually make some Sure, how would you address the partisan nature of Tallahassee given the Republican domination? The State House if elected as a member of what was likely to be again the minority party. Right, so, so I look at this as not a two year, but an eight year plan of dealing with this difficulty. And what I will tell you is that things are going to be forcibly changed as we're going to see at the polls in November to some degree, and that time will continue probably and it'll create some more responsibility for the Republicans on the other side of the equation to start looking at the more common problems that we have, because their constituents, just as well as the Democratic constituents, uh, are going to be and yelling and doing the same issues. So find common denominators, things that are in common, have collaboration and dialogue, and put together appropriate answers with professionals uh, giving us a round of applause, please, for our single legislative candidate.